Good morning in Washington, D.C. I hope you are having a good coffee at this very early hour in D.C. And good morning here in Madrid at a more reasonable hour. I guess that at 6.30 uh, a.m., public workers are still setting up the streets on Washington for another day. My name is Manuel Lejarreta, I'm the Secretary General of the Fundación Consejo de España, Estados Unidos, a Spain U.S. Council Foundation in English, and I have the pleasure to of welcoming all of you on behalf of our institution to this webinar, U.S. Elections 2020, Perspectives and the Democrats' Agenda. We are really lucky to have with us this morning in Washington, D.C., two outstanding speakers, David Wasserman and Roger Hickey. Good morning, David and Roger, and thank you for being here with us. Good morning, thank you. Before, before I introduce to them, uh, them to you, let me underline that this is an event co-organized by the Fundación Consejo de España, Estados Unidos, and the Fundación Alternativas, a relevant progressive think tank based in Madrid. Vicente Palacio is director of the Foreign Policy Observatory, is also with us this morning, and he will take the floor later and will conduct this webinar. Good morning, Vicente. Good morning, Manuel. Good morning, Washington, Roger, and Dave, also David. It's a pleasure. By the pleasure way, to, it's a pleasure to, to, to co-organize this event with you, Manuel. And I think it was a great idea. Um, we all have been very lucky to have this uh, debate um, and sharing with you, with um, the Fundación Consejo Estados Unidos España, and both with the audience and you both brilliant speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Vicente. By the way, Vicente, it has been a pleasure to work with you and with your team in organizing this online activity. Let me also say a few words about the Fundación Consejo de España Estados Unidos. This institution was created in 1997. It's a nonprofit organization based in Madrid, which brings together high representatives from business, public administration, and cultural and academic institutions. Some of the biggest Spanish companies working in the US market are the core of the institution. But we have also on board many relevant cultural and academic institutions. While the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation of Spain is the key public partner. Starting from, from the idea that, that the US is a key country, a close friend of Spain and a very important ally, and based on the belief that there is still a gap of knowledge between our two countries and a great potential to foster our relations, our objectives are the following ones. First, to boost cooperation between Spain and the United States in the economic, trade, commercial, business, scientific, and cultural fields, to improve our understanding, mutual recognition, and the respective images of both countries, and to foster relations with the North American community of Hispanic origin. As you can see, a task as ambitious as it is exciting. I give you now with Vicente Palacio, who will explain what, uh, what the Fundación Alternativas is about. Please, Vicente, you have the floor. Well, very briefly for the audience who still don't know us, um, for Roger and David, um, thank you again. Uh, Fundación Alternativas is the leading progressive think tank in Spain. Uh, we have to devote much time to transatlantic issues, to European issues related also to the United States. Um, so we are very happy to be here this morning with you all and organize this event with the Fundación Consejo España Estados Unidos. Fundación Alternativas, uh, again, has, has, has devoted much time to, to uh, uh, research and study on the US trends and what the changes uh, in the United States are uh, uh, at this moment. And okay, so I think that we should go uh, forward and have a, a wonderful uh, conversation this morning. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Vicente. As I mentioned earlier, we consider the US a key country and a good ally. That is something very easy to understand when we review the scope of our relations in every field. Additionally, the Fundación firmly believes in the transatlantic values that have forged the Western world for more than 70 years. And consequently, we work to promote decisively the transatlantic agenda in times of uncertainty and in the face of major challenges that's why we are so much interested in what is going on in the USA. 
the US elections are for sure of the utmost importance, not only for America, but for the entire world, and particularly for the European and Spain, for the European Union and Spain, traditionally allies and partners of Washington as well. Some remarks about the webinar before we start, technical remarks. Vicente Palacio, as you know, will moderate this debate. Later, we will deserve some minutes before closing for questions and comments from our attendees. In fact, you are most welcome to do it so right now through the chat. This is an event live broadcasted through our YouTube channel and is also being recorded. If you follow with Zoom platform, you can send us your question preferably through the question and answer and not in the chat. I repeat, it's better to receive if you are in Zoom through the question and answer and not uh, by the chat. If you follow us through YouTube, please, you can ask your questions in the chat enabled for it. Remember that any questions is welcome, any question is welcome both in English or in Spanish. We will translate to the speakers. After the end of this seminar, you will be able to watch it again at any time through the YouTube channel of both organizations. Let me now introduce our speakers. David Wasserman is the house editor of the Cook Political Report, the leading organization on analysis of US internal politics and elections since 1984, where he is responsible for analyzing US House election races. He is recognized as one of the nation's top election forecasters. In 2016, David drew praise for his accurate pre-election analysis, including the piece, How Trump Could Win the White House While Losing the Popular Vote, written just two months before the elections. David is also a contributor to NBC News, and his election commentary has been and is extensively quoted as primary reference in numerous top publications, including Politico, Politico, The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and RealClearPolitics.com. He has served as analyst for the NBC News election night decision desk in many years and has appeared on C-SPAN, CNN, Fox News, and NPR. By the way, this morning I could read a wonderful article uh, of, uh, by, by David in the New York Times. I, I strongly recommend about the elections. A native from, of New Jersey, David holds a BA in government with distinction from the University of Virginia and was awarded the 2006 Emerich Wright Outstanding Thesis Prize for his study on congressional distinctive standards. Roger Hickey is co-director of the Institute for America's Future, an organization launched by 100 prominent Americans to expand the national debate about America's economic future. The Institute is a center for ideas and action that works to build an enduring majority for progressive change in the United States. Most recently, in the wake of the election of President Trump 2016, Hike helped to write and build support for the Solidarity Agenda, pledged to fight for good jobs, sustainable prosperity, and economic justice. Hickey, as co-director of IAF, helped to organize and lead the national coalition of citizen leaders known as American United to Protect Social Security. Hickey was also a founder of Healthcare for America Now, a coalition that tried to influence the design of President Obama's healthcare plan and then pushed for its passage. A graduate from the University of Virginia, Hickey began his career in the 1960s as an organizer for the Virginia Students Civil Rights Committee and the Southern Students Organizing Committee. Okay, now that you know a little bit more about our two outstanding speakers, we can start. Let us start, Vicente, you've got the floor. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, as you will see, uh, these are uh, two speakers with outstanding uh, long careers. Uh, and I think that they will be complementary for this, uh, for this uh, conversation, which is a conversation, as a matter of fact, in, on, 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 on the challenges the US is facing in this uh, presidential election, uh, on the state of the presidential race, hmm, what's the state of the, uh, of the race, uh, which is a close, very close race, um, and the, of course the Democrats' alternative. What is the agenda of the Democrats, if, if, if there is any uh, consistent agenda 
that could uh, um, um, oppose or face uh, the uh, uh, President Trump uh, uh, second mandate. I, my first question uh, will be addressed to David, David, David Wasserman. Uh, David, we, uh, it's come down to election day. Uh, we are one month before the November 3rd election, less than one month, four weeks. Uh, at this moment, there are many burning issues on the table. In the United States, we have the economic recession. We have the White House hit by the COVID-19, which is uh, really uh, uh, surprising. We have the division, we have the police violence, uh, we have the climate change, uh, we have the fires in California, we have the, the debates and, and, and the quarrels uh, on, the, on, the, on the Supreme Court nominations. We have all these. So the, we, we are pretty much concerned as Spaniards and Europeans uh, on the, uh, for the state of, the, of your country, uh, not only on the state of our countries, which is, is a very bad condition as well. Um, I will ask you, could you, could you give us the whole picture of the US right now? Uh, at the end of the first mandate of uh, President Trump, what, what's, the, what, what, what's the state of the US democracy in general? Well, surely we have three hours to answer that question, right? Uh, uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having us. I think the most important uh, line in both my and Roger's biography is that we're both graduates of the University of Virginia. And uh, I would like to point out that uh, we won the National Basketball Championship in 2019. And uh, we are still the champions because the 2020 tournament was canceled. And so uh, we'd like to, like to point that out. Uh, also, I want to say thank you to, uh, to Manuel, to the Fundacion uh, for being such uh, wonderful hosts uh, when I visited Madrid and Barcelona in uh, the December of 2018. And yes, it feels as if we uh, in America have aged 10 years since 2018 uh, because of the amount of news and political developments that we've gone through even in just the last week. Uh, and we are in the in the final month, but at the same time, it feels like there could be uh, a an October surprise every day of October between now and the election. And uh, we all remember where we were at this point in October of 2016, when uh, there was a video that broke in the news of of, of Trump boasting of uh, of his his exploits with women. Uh, and we found Hillary Clinton with a large lead in the polls uh, that everyone assumed the election was over at that point. And of course, uh, once the spotlight turned back to Hillary Clinton and uh, the lead became much narrower, Trump was in a position where he was able to win the election uh, without even a plurality of the vote, but uh, while losing two points nationally. So all of us are, are still approaching this rather cautiously, even though all indicators point to a, a very large defeat for President Trump. Look, there are two reasons, uh, two demographic groups in America that explain why uh, Joe Biden has an eight or nine point lead on average in the national polls today. And uh, those are senior citizens, and, and women, um, particularly women who are working class, uh, white women in the upper Midwestern states. And uh, there, are, um, there are a couple of reasons why, uh, why we're seeing this. Uh, first of all, uh, Trump uh, is uniquely unpopular uh, with, with women uh, based on, on his temperament but also the Supreme Court fight that, that we're seeing has not helped him because uh, there, there, um, there were a couple issues in 2016 that uh, were responsible for allowing him to win. He, uh, he really emphasized trade and immigration and, uh, and emphasized American grievance on those two issues, uh, portrayed other countries as enemies. And uh, in that respect, he, he shared some commonalities with a number of working class uh, white uh, uh, independent voters and even a few Democrats in the key battleground states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And he 
he downplayed, he did not emphasize some of the issues that had given Republicans trouble with those voters over a number of years, such as abortion and uh, gay marriage. And he was able to, uh, to win over some people who for many years had thought of Republicans as the party of the religious right and Bible thumpers, as we would say here, or, uh, or wealthy people who wanted their tax cuts. Uh, and uh, the problem with the Supreme Court fight at the moment is that it it does bring more focus back onto uh, abortion and same-sex marriage and the, and Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, the health care bill uh, that uh, voters do not want repealed. And so uh, there are a, a number of, of voters who who went for Donald Trump because they did not like Hillary Clinton. But now it's more of a referendum on Donald Trump. And uh, Joe Biden uh, has taught a masterclass so far in letting his opponent self-destruct. Joe Biden has avoided taking risks. He has avoided inserting himself into the news. Even his performance in the debate was not uh, it was it was not uh, flawless. Uh, you know, Biden missed several opportunities here and there, but it didn't matter because Trump's behavior and Trump's recklessness uh, in the past week, in uh, as evidenced by his his hospital stay and his behavior uh, after his hospital stay, uh, has uh, has reminded voters why they do not like him. So it would take a uh, miraculous comeback at this point uh, to allow Trump any chance of victory. And I, I look forward to hearing what Roger has to say. Yeah, thank you, David. I guess, uh, Roger, that one of the features of the uh, American democracy right now is, the, is polarization, is polarization, social polarization uh, and political polarization. Um, just today, uh, as David mentioned, uh, Biden, Biden called for national unity in Gettysburg, uh, in his Gettysburg discourse. Um, I would ask, like to ask you to react to what David said on these two demographic groups of the senior citizens and women as the, one of the keys for the outcome of this election, but also uh, for the Democrats alternative, for the Democrats agenda. Uh, on, on, could you elaborate further on how the Democrats or the Democratic Party or the progressives think that they will could uh, uh, overcome the uh, polarization and build up uh, a new narrative for mm -hmm. national unity in a way? Right. Uh, Vicente, thank you very much. Manuel, uh, thank you for the two foundations for uh, convening this meeting across the Atlantic. Uh, it's very important uh, right now and you couldn't have asked for a more perfect time to have this discussion as david said we have just reached a very important turning point in this election in the last week uh, and for the democrats i think we are very lucky that if we are going to have a right-wing populist um, some call it fascist takeover of the united states we are very lucky that it's an incompetent one one that doesn't know how to use the levers of government, uh, an accidental president perhaps, but the, the, the fundamental fear of some on the left is that Trump was able to exploit uh, the polarization by focusing especially on white men, white men who used to be part of the backbone, uh, working class men, who used to be part of the, Dem the Democrats' backbone, uh, reliably democratic after the New Deal. And it is, uh, it is very important to realize that the new democratic coalition, as David said, um, is, is very different from the old democratic coalition. It's, it's the people that are turned off by Trump's excesses, uh, suburban women, um, African Americans, of course, were, and uh, and these, this Democratic Party is trying to come back after a very very shocking um, upset by by Trump 
uh, in which he managed to steal a lot of what should have been democratic issues. It's, it, it was a little bit like Brexit in, the, in, the, in Great Britain, where a large part of the working class was alienated, did not trust either party, but did not trust the Democrats. And Trump, who was sui generis, he is, he is unique in his political message, was able to barge in and say, don't trust anybody. Uh, I'm a hand grenade that you can throw into the political system and blow it up. Uh, now, as David said, he, uh, he has a record to run on. It's a terrible record. It's been complicated enormously by the COVID uh, outbreak and the economic crisis that uh, came after that. And so um, it is very, very likely that the, uh, the Democrats will, uh, will win. And given his erratic performance in the last week, that he will win, uh, that the Democrats will win very large. Um, the question is whether the Democrats uh, can reconsolidate a majority uh, and, and that really is, depends on whether we can, uh, Biden, is, is, Biden is ready made to unite the country at least temporarily. In fact, many, many Republicans are coming over to the side of Biden, mainly because they want to take back their party. They want to, uh, to be able to, uh, to have a Republican party that really stands for something. Um, it's, so it's very likely that he will win. The question is, can he consolidate a majority? Can he make the economy work for average working people at a time when it looks like we're gonna be facing yet another recession that could be very deep? And uh, we think that uh, as the result of the primary uh, debate between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and, uh, and Biden, that the Democratic Party is very unified. It is very unified around an agenda for investing in economic growth, in dealing with the, the uh, environmental crisis uh, in a way that, that builds jobs and uh, new industries. Uh, we believe that, that Biden has a, a good consensus within the Democratic Party to build on and uh, and he will have expectations for action. Um, he will have a mandate to take over and first of all, bring stability, normalcy, and secondly, address the very big problems, of COVID and the economy that face America right now. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I will ask you to give us a more briefly uh, responses. So that we have more more time for more questions and all. Thank you, thank you, uh, Roger. Um, David, coming back to the campaign, um, this seems to be a chaotic campaign, a chaotic, very unique, unpredictable uh, compared to previous uh, elections. You have a, a long career uh, as a, a researcher and an analyst on, on many uh, races, presidential and, and, and um, House uh, and Senate races. But Joe Biden uh, is campaigning, uh, is focusing on national COVID-19 response, basically, uh, uh, and the failures uh, of this administration to deal with it. What issue do you think that will determine the final results, the final outcome? Is, is this about this time, about the jobs? Is it about the pandemic? Is it about the mm, race, mm, race, race justice? How is the pandemic uh, hitting the so-called Trump economics, the, the economic miracle uh, created by uh, this uh, administration? Is it this time, is the economy stupid or is the pandemic stupid? What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, the, the good news for Trump in early September was that, uh, believe it or not, the uh, Americans had begun to uh, to treat the pandemic with more normalcy. Uh, they ranked it lower as their top issue. Uh, in fact, when uh, voters were asked their top issue in early or mid-September, uh, the coronavirus ranked third or so behind the economy and law and order in multiple polls of, of key states. Uh, but 
Trump's diagnosis and uh, more importantly, the rise in cases uh, that we've seen in the past uh, several weeks uh, has thrust coronavirus back into the spotlight. When you isolate each issue and ask voters how they think President Trump is handling them, 42% of Americans on average uh, approve of his handling of COVID, 56% disapprove. On race relations, 38% approve of his handling of race relations, 56% disapprove. The only issue on which he is still positively rated is on the economy, 51% approve of the job he's doing uh, on the economy, 47% disapprove in large part because voters see him as obsessed with the economy and the stock market to the exclusion of other issues that they believe he's mismanaged. And yet, uh, President Trump missed a very important opportunity yesterday to, uh, to maintain uh, a positive rating on the economy and to shift the focus back to the economy. He announced that he would not uh, be negotiating with Congress anymore to pass a large stimulus package. Uh, that's something that would have allowed him to say that he is able to work with Congress on a bipartisan basis uh, to pump more money into the economy and save, save jobs and small businesses. And he appears to have taken responsibility for throwing that away. Uh, I can't recall uh, a, a, more, uh, a, a more harmful uh, uh, act by a presidential candidate to their own chances of, of winning re-election than uh, what I've seen over the course of the past week. And the challenge for Trump is that he has a very hard time making the election entirely about the economy. This isn't happening in a vacuum. Voters are concerned about a variety of issues, including COVID and race relations. And Biden is doing a good job to come across as a moderate, uh, I do think that Biden could be a bit more aggressive, perhaps, in uh, in attacking um, Russia and and Putin as a means of deflecting uh, Trump's attacks on him as a Trojan horse for the radical left uh, and uh, someone who would lead to socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, Biden could also perhaps feature more support from uh, from sheriffs and police chiefs to try to. Uh, <clears throat> blunt the attack from Trump that Democrats are the party of chaos and violence and don't have any support from law enforcement. But uh, as long as Trump has been in the spotlight, uh, this is an election that looks very good for the Democrats and both the presidential and the Senate. Did you agree uh, with this, uh, Roger? Well, yes, I, I do. And I especially think that uh, what David said about about Trump's uh, pronouncement right after he came back from the hospital that he is going to blow up the discussions about uh, stimulating the economy and helping massive numbers of people who need help with COVID. That is a, an act of self-destruction. And it, it reinforces the point that I made earlier, which is we are very lucky that uh, this guy who has some obvious political talents, Trump, is also incompetent at, at, at actually running a government that would consolidate that support and, uh, and get himself reelected. We could imagine a scenario very different if COVID had not hit the world and Trump continued to take credit for the Obama economic growth and uh, Trump simply played on social resentments that he's so good at playing. Uh, this would be a very, very different election right now, and he would stand a much better chance of winning. I know that David has been looking at some of the, uh, the crucial swing states, the working class middle America states of Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. I, he, Trump is losing because of his obvious incompetence, his his actual threat to the health and safety of families in those states. Um, but if, if he had not blown it, if he had not, if he had instead acted as a responsible leader and at least pretended to be mobilizing the resources of the country to fight COVID, uh, he, would, he would be in a much, much, much better position. As I say, this past week, uh, it, 
began to set in and become obvious to most voters that we are dealing with an incompetent president who cares only about himself. If he were had a little bit more of a sense of mission and a sense of, uh, of mobilizing the resources of the country, uh, the Democrats would be in, in, in much worse shape. So uh, I would never say that we are lucky that we had COVID, uh, but uh, the COVID situation has managed to uh, mobilize all kinds of voters to say, we at, at the very least, we need to support a government that is competent, that can bring us back to normalcy, that can do the things that we depend on government to do. And this is a good thing for in the long run. It's a good thing that the American voters will endorse a candidate, Biden, I think, Excuse me, Ray. You, excuse yeah, me, Ray. If I interrupt you, but you seem to put the emphasis, all the emphasis on, on the supposedly uh, failures of um, President Trump uh, in uh, on, on on COVID nineteen. But I wonder if the Democrats uh, are um, too confident on the um, benefits that the COVID nineteen situation could bring to them, and much less on the uh, agenda, on the consistent agenda, uh, which has to do with uh, the climate, with environment, this, the so-called Green New Deal, uh, jobs, the healthcare, education, all this pack. Um, I don't know if, uh, if this is able to uh, unite, to bring yeah. together the, the a majority of Americans, or uh, if on the contrary, Uh, these issues are separated by constituencies and by uh, voters, whether Republicans and Democrats. I will like also to hear the, the, uh, the, 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 the opinion, the view of David as well. Well, uh, you are talking about issues, jobs, the environment, etc., that I have devoted my entire life to. And I believe that the Democrats ought to be talking about in this election. And I think that, uh, first of all, you should know that there is a massive mobilization uh, of people on the Democratic left who are working very hard in a very pragmatic way uh, to, to talk to voters about these things. And, and I think it's one of the great benefits of the craziness of the, uh, of, the, of the Trump administration that people are starting to value the role of government in, in creating jobs. In, in standing up to, uh, uh, to corporations who are exporting jobs out of the country. Um, so uh, yes, these issues are very, very important. I would never uh, not say that. But I also believe uh, that uh, uh, the country is terrified that we are never going to get out of this, this, uh, this health and economic crisis. They are linked and they are first and foremost looking for someone who is competent, who can build a majority, who can stop all of the fighting uh, that has dominated the, uh, the Trump years. So I would say both uh, the bread and butter economic issues and the return to normalcy are, are both important in this election. Yeah, David. Let, let's be honest. Uh, Even though Joe Biden uh, is basically touting unity and bipartisanship, uh, if he is elected president, he's going to have an extremely difficult time uniting the country for several reasons. Number one, uh, there's virtually no uh, way that uh, President Trump will accept the outcome of the result as legitimate. Uh, under any circumstances. We haven't even touched on uh, the unique nature of how we're holding this election, but uh, about half of the Democrats in the country are voting by mail or voting early in person, whereas Trump has told all of his supporters to vote on election day at polling places. And so there's, a massive, there's going to be a massive divide between the vote cast by mail and early, which is going to be for Biden and the election day vote for Trump. Trump is going to say after the election, regardless of the outcome, that uh, it was stolen from him, that, uh, that the mail ballots were fraudulent because you can't trust uh, you know, uh, 
uh, the, the ballots that were sent out and he's going to highlight nu numerous inaccuracies and so forth, all in, a, in an attempt to undermine the legitimacy of the election going forward. So that will be challenge number one uh, for, for President Biden if he were to win. The second is that it's very difficult for Joe Biden to pass much of an agenda through the Senate unless Democrats win a large majority. Right now, there's a possibility that Democrats could win uh, 50 Senate seats and Republicans could win 50 Senate seats, in which case there would be a tie broken by the vice president, who would be Kamala Harris. But uh, keep in mind that uh, under Senate rules, uh, Democrats would need to, uh, to end something called the filibuster to be able to pass anything with less than 60 votes in the Senate. And there's, uh, there are several conservative Democrats in the Senate, including uh, one Joe Manchin from West Virginia, who says that they will not vote to end the filibuster, which is this procedural rule. So for Democrats to pass a large stimulus, economic stimulus, for Democrats to pass any kind of climate change action uh, or legislation, which is not going to be a Green New Deal, but is, li you know, is likely to be something that is much closer to uh, what Joe Biden uh, believes, which uh, would include some protections for, uh, for uh, the natural gas industry, for example. Uh, if Democrats wanted to pass a voting rights bill in honor of John Lewis, who passed away earlier this year, all of these uh, pieces of the agenda will require uh, that Democrats have uh, a, uh, an advantage in the Senate uh, that's uh, beyond 50 seats. And so that, that's why uh, these lower level elections are going to be critical as well. David, did you forecast any significant changes uh, in uh, battleground toss up states? As you mentioned before, in the Midwest, basically Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and all, maybe others, maybe others like uh, Florida, North Carolina, and maybe Texas, who knows? Um, you, do you foresee any change, significant change there, or do you dare to uh, have any crystal, uh, crystal ball that can tell us uh, what might happen and um, if the, there could be some shift uh, in, the, in the voting uh, from Republicans to Democrats? Um, in that case, Governance uh, would be could be could get more could get easier for Democrats uh, mm -hmm. in the next uh, mandate. Um, what's what, yes? So, uh, in our system, there are really only a handful of states where voters' votes will matter a great deal because so many of our states are safely red or safely blue, uh, and the election will really come down to six states that Trump won by less than 5% of the vote in 2016. And those are Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin in the North, and uh, Florida, Arizona, and North Carolina in the South. Now, right now, Joe Biden is ahead in all six of those states. He's ahead maybe by one or two points in Florida and North Carolina, and he's likely ahead by five or six points in uh, in the other four. Um, th there are also uh, other states that are very close at the moment that Trump uh, carried in 2016, uh, including Georgia, Texas, uh, even Ohio and Iowa are states that he won comfortably, but are very, very close in the polls right now and could go either way. In fact, if Joe Biden were to maintain the kind of lead we're seeing right now, he could potentially win Texas, which is absolutely, absolutely massive state. Uh, you know, it's, I still say it's less than 50% chance that he does. But uh, w one of the things we're watching, uh, I'm part of a, a news network uh, on election night. Uh, I'll be at the decision desk for NBC News. And our job is to look at the data as it's coming in and project the races to declare a winner. Uh, we're very hopeful that we can get um, a, a, a lot of the result in from Florida and Texas early on election night, because we know that the states in the north are going to take a very long time to count the absentee ballots and the mail ballots that have arrived, uh, that they're not allowed to process until election day. So we'll be watching those states very carefully. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's possible that Joe Biden could win a very large electoral college victory if he sweeps a lot of those states. 
But if the race tightens, there's still a possibility of a very close race in the Electoral College, where even if Joe Biden is winning the popular vote nationally by 5%, that a lot of those states I just mentioned are within a point either way. So it's, there's a very thin line between a large victory and a very competitive race for the White House. Okay, uh, Roger, for, for winning the elections, uh, mobilization, mobilization, street mobilization, uh, mass protest, mass mobilization is, is a key uh, in this kind of uh, races. Um, now, this time, what is the current state of mobilization? How has the pandemic uh, affected or changed the dynamics of uh, street mobilization and how this could, could this affect or the, 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 the Democrats' uh, expectations for vote? Yes. I, I, namely, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of Latinos, women, students, workers. Yes. Uh, let me respond on two levels. Uh, Trump and the, the horrible policies of Trump have motivated the grassroots of the Democratic Party in a very, very uh, energetic way. Uh, the grassroots are out there right now working very, very hard, mainly for Democratic candidates on the local and on the state and on the federal level. Uh, that, that mobilization, which is motivated by all kinds of things. It's, you know, the, uh, the people that were in the streets talking about Black Lives Matter are now working the ballot boxes and trying to tell people how to do early voting through mail. Uh, the environmentalists are, are, are energized to go out there and talk to their people uh, and to make sure that this is a high turnout election. Now, as you say, the COVID crisis, the, the, the health challenge, uh, causes, makes it much harder to knock on doors. Um, in fact, the Republicans are probably doing more door knocking because they are oblivious to the, uh, to the health risks. But uh, the, the, the Democratic Party and the progressive groups have become very, very uh, innovative in A, raising money, B, finding ways to communicate to voters uh, electronically as we are today, um, uh, through, uh, through uh, apps and through phone calling. So uh, it's a new kind of, um, of turnout mechanism, uh, but in many, many states, including some of these crucial uh, battleground states, uh, there is a huge, huge effort to get people to vote, to vote early and, and, to, uh, and to turn out in larger numbers than they've turned out in any uh, previous election. Um, so, uh, uh, and there's a, there's a very, very good connection between the Democratic Party and the grassroots organizations, which has not always been true in the past. Uh, having a, an enemy, uh, having an enemy like Trump is a great motivator. And, uh, and therefore I think uh, that accounts for some of the uh, improvement in Biden's position in many of these states right now and the possibility of doing a much larger sweep in, in Senate races, for example. So I, I'm encouraged. I think it's, uh, uh, it's a very, very uh, energetic effort by Democrats of all kinds. David, what's, what's your prediction or your forecast on, on turnout, on the turnout? Will people uh, vote massively? Because we know that there is a lot of mail-in and drop box uh, voting this time. How will this affect the real vote? Because one thing is the polls, a very different thing. Another thing is, is, is the, what the people and how much people vote finally. So what, what do you think is gonna happen? Yes, it's an excellent question. And we are headed for massive turnout in this election, in my opinion. We are headed for likely between 150 million and 160 million votes cast. Uh, keep in mind, there were 137 million votes cast in 2016. So that would be a big increase. And we are already seeing uh, you know, record turnout in, in the mail. 
uh, but uh, uh, there, you know, there are two uh, aspects of this election that are um, silver linings for Trump. It's hard to find good news for Trump uh, right now because Biden appears to be headed for victory. But there are two factors that uh, that are good for Trump. The first is uh, in terms of new voter registration, uh, because the Biden campaign has gone to all virtual outreach for, for the most part, and the Trump campaign is pretending like the pandemic doesn't exist and is still knocking on doors, they have succeeded in registering about twice as many new voters as the Democrats. It's not enough to offset the kind of lead we're seeing for Biden in the polls, but in just four states alone that track party voter registration, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, uh, Trump has registered uh, about half a million new Republicans in the last six months compared to only 200,000 uh, net new Democratic registrations. So it's just something small to keep in mind. The other uh, thing that's going well for Trump is he's actually doing slightly better with Hispanic voters than he was doing in 2016, especially in Florida, in South Florida, with the Cuban and Venezuelan vote. And the reason uh, is really twofold. First of all, uh, in, in 2016, Trump didn't really have a, a Spanish language outreach campaign. Uh, his, in, his outreach campaign to Hispanics was to tweet out a picture of a taco bowl uh, and say, I love Hispanics. Uh, this time around, he's actually running a Spanish language ad campaign uh, in, in South Florida and in Arizona. Uh, and then the second uh, reason is that uh, he... Uh, is he's trying to portray Democrats and, and uh, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez and others as, uh, as communists and socialists and, uh, and, and try to uh, appeal to Cuban and Venezuelan uh, voters on, on, that, uh, on that issue. Uh, and so right now, Biden is leading Hispanic voters nationally by 28 points on average. Hillary Clinton was leading Hispanics by 38 points. Uh, so there is some loss of ground for Democrats there, uh, but Biden has made up for that with gains among white voters. Roy, uh, coming back to what you mentioned before, I think it was David or you as well, on the um, possibility that uh, if uh, President Trump loses the election, he, he, he could challenge the results and he, he could not accept the defeat in the case that, uh, in the event that might happen. Uh, so he, he could throw any outcome into the Supreme Court or uh, into the House of the Representatives where he enjoys a majority of 26 uh, seats, uh, states uh, right now. Uh, could, 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 could we witness a, a constitutional crisis? Because there, we learned much about this, we heard much about this uh, these days, the, 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 the possibility that this happens and that will be a disaster. Uh, what, what, in that case, uh, what would be the, the, the response of the, from, the, the, from the progressive camp in general, social and political? Well, uh, as David said, the best way to avoid this crisis is to have a massive uh, win in, in many, many states. Uh, so that it, it's just unthinkable uh, that, that Trump could challenge the outcome. Uh, what's likely is that because there's so many mail-in votes, it's gonna take a long time to count. Uh, it could be that Trump on the first night when David is with NBC News, uh, that, uh, that Trump could claim that he's ahead because it takes time to count all these votes uh, that are coming in. Uh, and it's also been, been rumored that Trump is trying to go to the governors, the Republican governors in key states and, and the legislatures and telling them, you can authorize a different slate of electors. We have this ancient system, uh, uh, the, the electoral college, and he is trying to convince places where the Republicans are in control that they can simply create a new set of electors for their state. Uh, pro-Trump, of course. Uh, this would be met with outrage, and it's, people are already trying to expose this and warn the governors and the legislatures not to do this. So uh, it's, it's already on people's minds, 
um, if it were to, I think it's very unlikely that this would come to a head in the Supreme Court, but it could. Um, and, uh, and of course, there would be nationwide demonstrations. There would be a, a big attempt to get Republicans to, uh, to condemn this and to vote against it. Uh, so there are people uh, in both parties actually who are preparing for this and to preparing to, uh, to stop any kinds of games with the electoral system. Uh, but as David says, I agree with him, uh, what we need is a massive turnout and a massive repudiation of Trump in all of these elections so that he cannot claim there was miscounting or any other um, uh, shenanigans that, that could be stealing the election from him. It needs to be very, very clear uh, that this, uh, this election is election that says goodbye Trump, we want you out of here. And I think that is likely to happen. Okay, Roy, thank you. Uh, I think that there are, we have many questions from the chat, in the chat from the audience that will be interested to address to you. So I Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Well, I have, I have some questions. Uh, first, uh, it's a question for David. Uh, what is going to be the the, well, uh, the the consequences of of Trump's last hour's attitudes? Do you think this this could turn the the campaign in favor of Biden, of of candidate Biden? Well, uh, it already was in favor of Biden, and uh, yes, it does appear that between the debate and uh, Trump's hospital stay, uh, Biden's lead has gotten wider. We've seen. Uh, on average, the polls go from a Biden lead of seven points nationally to uh, now we've had two polls that show Biden with a lead over 10 points nationally. I would be cautious, though, of uh, believing that that uh, that sugar high is going to last. At some point, uh, the race is likely to return closer to where it was before Trump's hospitalization, just because uh, vo voters have a very short attention span. Uh, it was only two weeks ago that we were talking about how uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death would be the topic of discussion for the rest of the race. It was only one week ago that we were talking about how Trump's taxes would be the topic of discussion for the rest of the race. Now Trump just got out of the hospital. We could be talking about something entirely different next week. So we have to be very careful about, uh, our, uh, about uh, taking a long-term view of each and every event that happens. Yes, thank you. And now a question for Roger. What thing should Biden improve for the next debate? Well, I, I think he, uh, he is doing a fairly decent job. He needs, I think, to, uh, to talk about what's the role of a president in our system. I think he needs to be, at, at, at one hand, reassuring about how we, we need to get back to a, a president that we can trust, who is constitutional, who is, uh, is, is someone who plays by the rules, and also the role of the president as leader, as, as um, charting a course, uh, whether it be uh, to mobilize resources on the COVID crisis or to rebuild the economy. And, and uh, I think Biden has a lot to work with in terms of the positions that he's taken uh, on both those fronts, uh, but he needs to contrast himself as a leader who can be presidential as opposed to uh, uh, Trump, who is a chaos uh, uh, president who is, is constantly uh, uh, throwing the country into, uh, into crisis. Um, he also needs to be able to uh, get the rules changed so that uh, Trump's microphone gets turned off uh, if, uh, if he tries to, to uh, talk over everybody else in the, in the room. Um, we, we hope there will be more debates. It's not clear whether Trump will be recovered in time to do these debates. Um, but uh, uh, I think people are... Uh, Biden has a wonderful opening to be presidential in these upcoming debates. 
Thank you very much. Now a question for David again. Uh, this is a friend from Spain, Rafael Soriano from Cervantes Institute, who says that around 70% of the population of, in the US identify themselves as Hispanic. What is your perception of their electoral preferences? So the, uh, the Hispanic vote in, uh, in the presidential race is very important in two states, Arizona and Florida. But of course, the Hispanic vote is not monolithic. There are a variety of different subgroups that are important. And so in, uh, in Arizona, the good news for Joe Biden is that uh, the Hispanic vote is of Mexican ancestry. And Trump has done a number of things uh, uh, over the course of his campaigns to alienate uh, voters of Mexican ancestry. And uh, so right now in Arizona, Biden is leading um, but perhaps, you know, 70 to 30 among Hispanic voters. Uh, in Florida, the situation is quite different because uh, Trump has managed to revive the, the typical Republican strength among Cuban voters that was lacking in 2016. And he's made some inroads with, with South and Central American voters. And so uh, the Hispanic vote in Florida is more like 60-40 or, or, you know, maybe on a good, good night for Trump, maybe even 55-45 Biden. Uh, the reason is that even though Cubans are Republican, uh, they are not a majority of Florida's Hispanic vote. Puerto Ricans are an extremely uh, large voting block in the Orlando area. And, uh, and Trump's mismanagement of Hurricane Maria means that, uh, that Puerto Ricans are likely to go overwhelmingly for Biden. And so uh, it's going to be a, uh, a big struggle uh, for Trump in both of those states. But of the two, it, I, I do think Trump has the better chance in Florida. Thank you. Uh, Roger, another participant uh, asked the, the following question. What is, in your opinion, uh, uh, what's in your opinion about the role of and relevance of vice president, vice, vice president's candidates? Well, I think uh, uh, it will be of lesser importance. They're debating tomorrow in Salt Lake City. Um, uh, I think uh, Kamala Harris is a young, exciting candidate uh, that many uh, younger voters identify with. Uh, she is a good contrast uh, to Pence, uh, the current vice president, who uh, is a fundamentalist Christian and a, a very loyal uh, Trump supporter. So uh, I think the fact that they are, Harris is breaking a glass ceiling for women uh, and for uh, African Americans. Uh, that's, that's a reason for many, many people to come out and, and vote for her. Uh, possibly she will have a career uh, beyond this as a presidential candidate. So uh, I think it's, it's working very well for, uh, uh, for the Democrats. Uh, Pence has a difficult task of trying to appear calm and reasonable uh, while his, uh, his president is appearing erratic and crazy. Uh, so he has a he has the more difficult job in the uh, in the debates. Thank you, David. Another question. That's a very good question. What is the contingency for Trump declaring victory before all the absentee and postal ballots have been counted? Well, it's pretty clear that uh, Trump would like to freeze the election night results at around nine or ten p.m because the very first votes that are going to be reported from uh, these states like Pennsylvania are going to be the election day ballots, which are going to be very heavily for Trump. Uh, and he's going to portray anything that comes in or is counted after election day as fraudulent. Uh, unfortunately, I think most Republican election officials at the state level understand that, uh, that all votes need to be counted and there are enough Republican congressional leaders who, uh, who would repudiate uh, Trump. Now, that's not to say that all of them will. I think there are a number of very loyal Trump allies that will continue to uh, try to contest the election all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, if the Supreme Court were to validate states, for example, um, appointing their own electors instead of 
appointing uh, electors to who, whichever candidate uh, won the state, then there would be open revolt and chaos in the country. And uh, I, I don't believe that uh, that position would be tenable. Thank you. Another question for Roger, although I think we have already discussed about that. What about the difference between the popular and electoral vote? Could it happen the same that happened last election, 2016? It could happen. It could be that uh, Trump wins uh, the electoral college and, uh, and the Democrats uh, win the popular vote. Uh, I think all that we have been talking about today is that it's it's a very different situation uh, from uh, from the uh, from the Clinton uh, race uh, against Trump, um, and uh, I hope and pray that that both will be the same. The both that the Democrats will win both the popular vote and the electoral college vote, and. Uh, uh, of course, it's, it's the electoral college in our system uh, that carries the day. So uh, uh, that's that's what we've been discussing. It's is looking much much better for the Democrats in many of the states that are, were crucial to Trump in the last election. Okay, if I may, I will ask to ask a question to both of you, uh, since uh, well, uh, Spain is uh, Europe and Spain we are the allies of the United States. What what would we expect uh, if 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 uh, Trump wins the election again in terms of relation with Europe and what could we expect if 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 Biden wins the, the election, uh, David? As uh, Biden has already indicated that he wants to take a much more inclusive approach to the world uh, than Trump, uh, Biden would like to uh, open up uh, more trade relationships and. Uh, and take a more, uh, more more moderate approach as opposed to both uh, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders who have advocated more protectionist positions. Uh, Biden will also seek to, to bolster uh, traditional alliances uh, and especially NATO uh, and, and uh, a, adopt a more uh, aggressive posture towards, towards uh, Putin and Russia and if we, if, if Trump is reelected, we can expect more of the same. Okay. Uh, Roger, what do you think about? Well, uh, I think there will be celebration in Europe if, uh, if Biden wins. Um, I can remember uh, I was lucky enough to be invited by the PSOE to Spain uh, in the days right after the, uh, the Obama election because uh, people in Europe and people in Spain just simply wanted to hear about the uh, the uh, the Obama victory and what it meant for Spain and for Europe. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, Biden uh, is an Atlanticist. He is someone who believes in those uh, treaties, both military and um, economic. Uh, I think you will see a revival. Of the, uh, of the the commission and the uh, the treaty on uh, on global warming and a, a very serious attempt to get all of the countries working both on environmental issues but also on on the economic recovery if biden is smart he will try to do a co coordinated effort to recover the global economy and especially driven uh, by the united states and europe together uh, so uh, I think it's 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 a very stark contrast. Uh, if if Trump were to be elected, you would see uh, more attacks on NATO, more attacks on on democratic allies, and unfortunately, a lot more alliances with uh, authoritarian leaders uh, around the world. So thank you very much. Uh... I would like to stress something uh, that the Fundación Consejo Español de Estados Unidos is politically neutral. Uh, we, 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 we choose the title of the content of this webinar because we think that Democrats are the alternative, but that not, doesn't mean that we are in favor neither of Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden. We are politically neutral, but we thought that we know more uh, Trump than Biden. That's why we wanted to, uh, to, to focus on, on that line. So. Uh, before I close, would you like to say something, Vicente? 
Oh, yes. Uh, from fundacional alternativas, uh, we are not neutral. We're progressive, but we try to be neutral this time. And uh, of course, what we wish is that there is a um, oh, the game is open. And well, good luck for everyone. And good luck for the United States and for Spain and for Europe. We we uh, have a proposal also for David and Roger, which is that after this conversation we could open up after the election the the conversation to foreign policy and global issues which could be interesting as well from your uh, uh, viewpoint thank you thank you very much uh, manuel thank you very much vicente i still gratitude goes also to david and roger we really appreciate your readiness and kindness to collaborate with us with the fundación alternativas and fundación consejo in this webinar in those hectic weeks and days before the, the, the elections in which both of you, we know very well, are fully booked. It has been a very interesting exchange of views. And I feel that during this hour attendees, we have enjoyed a lot and learned a lot about the upcoming elections and the democratic agenda. That's all. The Fundación Consejo España de Estados Unidos and the Fundación Alternativas will continue offering more activities linked United States, a friend country that we really admire. Thank you very much, uh, David, Roger, and Vicente, and all of you, all our attendees, for being here with us this morning in Spain and also across the ocean in Washington. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Muchas gracias. Thank you for your friendship. Yes. Bye. Okay.